In the previous episode, we examined the fact that a lot of quasars seem to lie across from a central galaxy and have a very similar redshift to each other. In this episode, we will start by examining some of the safer galaxies which seem to produce many, many quasars. We will then examine how the redshift of galaxies and companion galaxies breaks the idea that redshift is only related to recessional velocity and shows a clear hierarchical structure. NGC 1097. This galaxy has the most extensive low surface brightness optical jets of any known galaxy. On one side, just between the bright optical jets, is a concentration of five or six bright quasars. Zooming out a little, and we can see a concentration of about 40 quasars, which seem to be concentrated around this galaxy. Examining the X ray images, clearly shows lines and pairs of fainter X-ray sources coming off the nucleus region of this galaxy. There is also a large excess of X-ray sources around the disk region of the galaxy. These may well be newer ejected material. This galaxy is very active in terms of ejecting material. Further examination of the X-ray images reveal a very strong X-ray source about 1.9 degrees to the southwest. It is identified as a BL LAC object. This object is on a line of sources southwest from NGC 1097, which coincides very closely with the counter jets of the strongest optical jet to the northeast. Now these BL LAC objects are so named because it was originally classified as a variable star within our own galaxy. It was then discovered that faint redshift lines could be detected. They are very rare objects, and through ARP's work it is apparent that it seems to be most often associated with nearby safer galaxies, as opposed to normal galaxies. These are objects which have a spectra dominated by a non-thermal continuum radiation and have strong X-ray and radio emissions. NGC 4151. Now this is another safer galaxy. Again here when we examine the X-ray image we see a line of X-ray sources stretching in a line through the galaxy and beyond. These are identified with blue stellar objects and are likely candidates for quasars. To the north there is also a very strong X-ray source that is associated with a BLAC object. Detailed X-ray images also reveal what appears like a connection between this object and the galaxy NGC 4151, which are both at different redshifts. High resolution radio imaging of the nucleus also reveals what looks like further material being ejected from the nucleus. ESO 416G002. Here is another example of a safe galaxy with three strong X ray sources located across this galaxy. One is a quasar and one is a BL LAC object. 3C48. Now, this was the first quasar to have been discovered. M33 is one of the brightest galaxies in our local group. It is a companion galaxy to M31 and has a rather young stellar population. 3C48 sits just 2.5 degrees away from it. On the other side of M33, we find another exceptionally bright high redshift quasar, PKS 0125 plus 25. Let's examine galaxies and understand if companion galaxies that seem to orbit around a central galaxy show any pattern of redshift and are in any way related to quasars or ejected material from these galaxies. M31 is a giant spiral galaxy historically given the name the Andromeda Nebula. M31 is the most massive galaxy in our group and is classified as a spiral barred galaxy. Every major companion is positively redshifted as seen from M31. The next nearest group to us, M81 group, is also centered on a massive spiral barred galaxy and once more every major companion is redshifted with respect to it. So would this effect also be visible on larger scales of superclusters? If we examine the Virga cluster, we know that this is made up of many galaxies. There are two ways that this can be examined. Firstly, if we assume that the luminosity of a galaxy is proportional to its mass, so by weighing the redshift by the brightness of each galaxy, we can calculate a mean redshift of plus 863 kilometers per second. Now, if we simply assume that each galaxy has the same mass, we end up with a mean redshift that lies between 1,000 
and 1200 km per second. The difference here reveals an important point, that the smaller galaxies have a systematically higher redshift. Can we assign redshift as a function of galaxy type? In this diagram we can see the excess redshift of the companions as a function of their morphological type in the nearest two galaxy groups M81 and M31. And this pattern is also evident when we examine the same chart for the Virgo cluster. More interesting in the Virgo diagram is that we see these barred spiral galaxies not only have the lowest redshift, but it is actually negative, in other words blue shifted. The only six major galaxies in the Virgo cluster all have a blue shift. We also see this out in our local group where M31, which was previously discussed, has a negative redshift of minus 86 km per second. Within the cluster we also see that the S0 type of galaxy is abundant. It is a kind of galaxy disk without bright young stars. These show a continuous gradient redshift from the brightest to the most faintest. It is therefore possible to pick any value for the redshift by simply selecting the desired S0 galaxy, and this is exactly what we find. Along the right we see a list of published redshifts for the Virgo cluster, and you will see that it varies wildly. Now if we assume that there is a relationship between a parent and a companion galaxy, and from the evidence that we see these companions have a higher redshift than their parent, then we would expect to find these companions around this with the youngest ones moving away. And this would look something like this. So you have a dot with all of those around it, and those around it would be the companions, the, the younger ones. But if we assume that the redshift that we detect was only due to recessional velocity, then this diagram would distort out of view and would make it look like this, because again we would be assuming that those younger ones have a higher redshift and therefore must be further away. Now if we plot the galaxies in the Virgo cluster as a function of their redshift, then we end up with the following diagram which is often referred to as the finger of God pointing directly at us, but this of course assumes that redshift is a direct measurement of distance, and again you will see Comparing it to the first diagram, to the second diagram that we looked at when we looked at just a single galaxy, that this distorted view creates this finger of the god. So it somehow is pointing to the fact that our assumption, particularly when we look at the Virgo cluster, is wrong because we end up with this diagram that has these massive lines in the center of redshift. NGC 3561b now here we see an example of what some might describe as a galaxy merger, but this may well be a great example of the opposite. In this image we see material being ejected along a jet-like structure from an elliptical galaxy. Exactly opposite this we see a counterjet, a magnificent straight plume punching through a disrupted spiral. Again close to this ejected galaxy we also find a quasar with a redshift of 2.2. If we examine the redshift of this group, we see the same pattern as before. All the companions have a higher redshift when compared to the parent galaxy. The Hercules Cluster. When examining the Hercules Cluster, we see the same pattern again. In every subsection of the cluster, the later type spirals or companions have a conspicuously higher redshift than the earlier type galaxies in the same sector. The Booty's Void. Here, when one astronomer was studying a cluster of galaxies, they found that most of the companion galaxies had a positive redshift relative to the dominant galaxy. Now let's examine compact groups of galaxies. The first compact group of galaxies were discovered in 1877 by M. E. Stevens. In 1961, Margaret and Geoffrey Burbage measured redshifts of the five galaxies and showed that they were 800, 5700 and 6700 kilometers per second. Now the 5700 and the 6700 galaxies were entwined together. If the redshifts were related only to the velocity, then this meant that they were moving apart at a thousand kilometers per second. Now galaxies don't normally move at this speed, and the gas within the galaxy would be unlikely to keep up at these two separate velocities. Often these are interpreted as mergers, and require dark matter and gravitational lensing to attempt to explain what we see. In the intervening years, Paul Hickson has catalogued, photographed and measured redshifts in a sample of over a hundred compact groups, and, the, and when we examine the evidence from his catalogue, we can clearly see 
the difference in apparent magnitude between the brightest and the next brightest galaxy becomes larger, the number of positively redshifted companions becomes larger too. And this shows that one galaxy is dominant within the group. When we examine our local group, what is striking is that there are no redshifts above 300 kilometers per second. And the reason for this is quite simple. Astronomers are just not willing to call any galaxy more than 300 kilometers per second higher than M31, a member of our local group. Because of course that would mean that recessional velocity is not the only factor in redshift. If you examine the brightest galaxies as they fall on the sky, it is immediately obvious that there is a loose string of them running out of M31 through M33 and ending close to 3C120, near the disk of our galaxy. These galaxies have redshifts up to 900 km per second and are obviously members of the local group. A group of later type spirals called the Sculptor Group is located closer to us than the M81 group. Now one point that is often argued in the case of some of these compact galaxy groups is that one or other of the highly redshifted galaxies is not actually part of the group but is situated much further back. The problem with this thinking is that if that were true then you would expect to find exponentially more background galaxies with higher redshifts in comparison to other galaxies and what we actually find is the opposite, they actually decrease. Spiral galaxies as young, low, luminous galaxies. The companion galaxy northeast of NGC 4151 has sharply defined spiral arms. This type of galaxy is normally defined as a high luminous galaxy due to their higher redshift, which are taken as an indication of distance and thus higher luminosity. Since it is attached to the low redshift NGC 4151, it must have an intrinsic redshift and a low luminosity. NGC 7319 is another example of a high redshift galaxy which must in fact be at the same distance as the low redshift NGC 7331. Now there is an alternative method for calculating distance to galaxies called the Tully-Fisher method. When we compare the redshift distance with the Tully-Fisher distance and plot them on a graph, it immediately becomes obvious that they agree very well for normal spiral galaxies, but for the high luminosity spirals, the redshift distance is too great by up to 40 megaparsecs. And this problem means that not only are we assuming it is too far away, and therefore it must be brighter, but also that the galaxy itself is much too large. If we take a quick look at NGC 309 and overlay one of the largest galaxies that we know an accurate distance to, which is M81, you will see that M81 is swallowed by the colossal size of NGC 309. Another example is NGC 450. It has a redshift of 1900 km per second, and the close by companion has a redshift of 11,600 km per second. Just at the point of the interaction, there are three hydrogen regions at the same redshift as NGC 450. Further detail analysis by Mariano Moles identified six different observational results, all of which led him to the conclusion you would have to invoke an enormous conspiracy of accidents in order to avoid the conclusion that the companion is a moderately low luminosity galaxy interacting with NGC 450. Part of this analysis also showed that the hydrogen region closest to the companion had a redshift in excess of 400 km per second. This is well in excess of the escape velocity of NGC 450. Now many might complain that this is only a small sample and therefore not representative of the entire visible cosmos. But this is simply not true. Arp was meticulous in his work and it is simply not possible for me to show you all the many many examples he catalogued. In one particular piece of work, he conducted a survey of 99 bright spiral galaxies and carefully compared them to non-galaxy controlled fields. He demonstrated the interaction and peculiar companions are significantly associated with the central bright spirals. When we examine the locations of galaxies versus companion galaxies versus quasars across the entire data set that ARP collected, then the following distribution becomes evident. 
we also see many examples of these companions forming along the spiral arms of galaxies. In NGC 1672, we see a Saphid galaxy, which has two strong X-ray sources located at points equidistant from the nucleus. Could it be that those ejected along the plane of rotation would evolve within the host galaxy and therefore appear as if they are galaxy mergers when in fact they are the opposite? Another possible example of this is Mark 573, which shows a pair of radio sources ejected in the plane opposite the nucleus. Hydrogen alpha gas seems to be forming bow shocks around these ejected sources. ESO 161 IG24 is another fine example. Here is a galaxy with three spiral arms, and on the end of each appears a companion galaxy. This galaxy is quite remarkable in that its longest arm has a series of large knots along it, which look like the beginnings of new companions. The most important takeaway from this video is that we see redshift differences between active galaxies and its companion galaxies. This is consistently seen across the board. These companions can form both along the axis of rotation, but also along the plane of rotation as well. By using the Tully-Fisher distance measurement system, we can clearly see that there is a huge problem with the so-called high luminosity, high redshift galaxies, which are more likely much closer and much smaller and hence much lower luminosity. This together with the information in the first video starts to paint a picture which shows that galaxies may form from other galaxies through the material ejected from the core. What we see as galaxy mergers may in fact be the opposite. Quasars and Bialak objects may well be the initial formation of a galaxy which then slowly evolve into what we see as companion galaxies. The redshift slowly decreasing. Objects that are more mature than us will therefore appear as a negative redshift. In other words, blue shifted. As always, be brave, be curious. The truth is waiting for us. Until next time.